right, well, thank you, you guys. Thank you, Manish. Uh, and um, Here. OK, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. And this is uh, a little change of pace here from the last session, uh, which was great, by the way. Um, we have the pleasure of having a very distinguished uh, uh, speaker and, and uh, panelist here. His name is DJ Partil. DJ is, uh, has many distinctions. He is the US chief data scientist, uh, which is a big thing. But before that, he was a VP of products at a company called Relate IQ, which if Salesforce.com hadn't bought, would probably have threatened Salesforce.com, is, is at least our view. Uh, and then uh, prior to that, he was one of the early folks at LinkedIn and is responsible for coining many terms, including uh, he's writing the books on, or the, uh, the articles on, on how data science is, is one of the sexiest professions of the 21st century. Uh, he also has a distinction, folks, by the way, that he is the son of, the, of, of Suhas and Jayashree, who are actually one of the founders of Thai, which might be his biggest distinction of them all. So, and they're in the audience right there. So. so with that, uh, what we're gonna do is just a chat here, and I have this, uh, this uh, notepad here. If you have time, we'll take questions. It's a pretty short um, window of 15 minutes, and we're going to try to keep this thing on schedule. So let me start with, um, with something that DJ knows well, which is data science. So this is a question on the future of data science. And so the question is, is the future of data science in better algorithms? Is it on focusing on business problems that these algorithms solve, something that Yugal was also talking about? Focusing uh, uh, that or on focusing on improving the human condition. So for example, medicine, something that I think he's looking at now. Or is it something entirely different? There's, uh, thank you for that. There, there's the coolest thing about seeing how much has evolved around data science and, and these movements. And you know, I think if we step back and we first say, where does this field come from? It's, it's really just a reinvention of the work that's been that's been done for generations. You know, I, I, I was fortunate enough to, to uh, my father, Suhas Patil, uh, you know, he's a professor for many years, so I just, just got to browse through his books. And so, you know, he's working at the cutting edge of, of all these things at MIT. And so, despite my inability to really do well in high school, I was able to, to really absorb that. And there's, the thing I would encourage people to first think about about data science is, there's so many fantastic lessons from the past that can be reapplied given the changing nature of products, of computational power, uh, algorithms. Uh, it, it's, it's just phenomenal. One of the classic ones is at LinkedIn in the early days, we had this massive problem about people you may know, and it just kept on tipping over with the Hadoop jobs and just kept on failing. And, it, it, and the way we figured it out was you know, I remember my dad talking about how he built uh, either the first or I don't know, it was the first scheduler, uh, you know, of, of, of time schedulers. And I was like, oh, this is the same problem. We just have to build a time scheduler. But nobody had really thought about why I'd build time schedulers that way. And so just taking wisdom that has been learned and applying it in the modern incarnation is something that I think is wide open and a great avenue. On the side of where the things I think are really unique right now, uh, I, I think the best avenue for data science is, is actually in the human condition. I think that's a great way of phrasing it. We had uh, two horrific earthquakes just recently in Nepal. Uh, some of the people who took the fastest action are data scientists. They take the imagery, they look at what's happening, they get updates, they're, they, they're mining Twitter, they're taking you know, pictures that are just being posted on Flickr, and they're putting that all together to aid in disaster response. And think about how radical that is now for large governments to say, OK, well, let's rely on the data scientists to give us the biggest update on that's happening on the ground, on the ground conditions and thinking about reliability. Because the best data is no longer inside the walls. It's on the outside of the walls. And then for me personally, the project that I'm working on is, is called Precision Medicine, the Precision Medicine Initiative, which the president announced at the State of the Union. And this idea to bring data scientists together with bioinformatics, with clinicians, is, is there is so much opportunity. I mean, it is, it is unbelievable. And so just having the privilege to work with people like Francis Collins, who, who's the guy who you know, really helped decode the genome, and, and people like that, you know, just getting the great data science people to the table and everyone combined with physicians, I think we're about to really see what's going to unlock the next generation 
of uh, medicine. And that, that is, the foundation of that is gonna be interoperability of data, but also utilization of the data to give you better insights and meaning, rather than just saying, hey, here's a bunch of data that you can see about yourself. Yeah, that, that's great, thank you. Okay, so a uh, little bit more for the, the geeks and the nerds in the room. So uh, there are many new emerging fields around data science. Uh, for example, there is, of course, uh, deep learning, right? There is artificial intelligence. There's, of course, machine learning, which we know about. So how do you see the field from a technology perspective evolving? What, what are these terms? Do they work with each other? Well, if you if you go to the East Coast, they often refer to data science as is you know just a West Coast statistician. So, you know, so when we say these are the most modern incarnations, you know, we got we got this other side that that, that we have to think. The the thing that, which is super exciting to me is how do we take these products and these these technologies and apply them to a product. And the thing I would encourage people to think about is a data product doesn't actually have to really show data. The best data products in the world facilitate an end goal through the use of data. You know, when you, you know, if 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 you had a self-driving car and it gave you all the real-time updates of data, that would not be that interesting. You know, you know, we look at these things like the Minority Report and those kind of just, just, you know, blasting you with data. That's what we call data vomit. <laughs> I mean, it's it's just overload. So the thing that I think is really unique with these technologies is that it's additional ways to approach the problem and make the problems, to go faster on these problems and then make the problems scalable. But I would really encourage people not to lose sight. Like, uh, to, to, the goal here is that we're humans for a reason. We have intuition, we have ethics, we have morality. Let's not seed that to a set of algorithms. If just type into Google GPS and Cliff and see how many people drive off cliffs because they listen to a three and a half inch screen. I mean, it's a little disturbing. <laughs> you know, it's like, turn right. You're like, no, there's a cliff. Ah, okay, I will. It just yells enough at you, you do it. And, and that's, there's something fundamentally weird about that. But as data becomes more ubiquitous and the opportunity for data to engage and interact with us with algorithms, I think we really have to think about how do we make sure that the human is really at the center and in the front of, of, of these algorithms and, and these problems. Yeah, um, that actually leads me to my next question, uh, which is about sort of related issues to these, uh, these newer emerging technologies. So one of the questions I have is around ethical dilemmas. So the, the question is, you know, when you have machine reasoning versus humans reasoning, you are possibly going to get into ethical dilemmas of the kinds of things you discover about people and about systems. So that's what, how does one go about thinking about that? And then also there is a related issue of, uh, you know, either inadvertent or even planned transgressions of personal privacy, mm -hmm. right? With the first panel, if you recall, guys talked about it as well. So, and this can happen, for example, for those of you that are, that are familiar with, with these technologies, if you have data lakes, and if data lakes don't have adequate lineage in the data that's coming into the lake, and you run algorithms on it, you actually can discover things about people or events and so forth, and then release that information without realizing it's, it's in some fashion private. So how does one go about thinking about these sorts of topics? Well, the first thing that we do is we make sure that we get the best people in the world in the room. And, and just this week, we announced that uh, Ed Felton uh, who's a very well-regarded and famous, in my opinion, uh, one of the best computer scientists out there today. Ed is best known for actually figuring out how to take the watermark, the watermark out of the digital, uh, uh, you know, those audio files when we actually used to care about that kind of problem. Uh, nowadays, it's amazing how that used to be the, the problem that captured a mind and now longer is relevant. But he's also been really right now at the forefront of questions around electronic voting. Uh, the ability, how secure are those systems? What about uh, collection and encryption? He's been one of those people that has been a, extremely uh, uh, thoughtful and, and, and a deep thinker, and now he's a colleague at, uh, uh, at the White House as well. And so we make sure we have people like that. 
Second is, I think it is essential, and this is actually another lesson uh, that my dad, I know, has talked about here at, at Thai many, many times, is the need to really insert humanities in the training programs. And so I think it is essential that every data scientist, every computer scientist, must take a, a, a more well-versed uh, curriculum in the humanities. And part of that curriculum needs to include uh, ethics. Just like we saw in biology, that we had a framing of bioinformatics uh, and developing, and we said, oh, we this is a field, bioethics. The same way the time is now that we must start thinking about what is data ethics. These questions are very, I, mean, I can't stress how critical it is for us to come up with the right notion and the legal frameworks. If you are coding an algorithm for a car and you have to make the classic ethical decision of save the driver or crash the car into, uh, you know, kill the driver, save the driver, or, you know, crash the car into a bunch of people. What's the, how do we think about that? Because now we're putting the data scientists in, in the line of, of direct control around how to think of, like, like, there's a real ethical choice here. Is your responsibility to the car? Uh, that is a car responsibility to the owner of the car, or driver, to the insurance premium, to society. Uh, uh, this, these are really weird, very fast. And, and uh, now is the time to start thinking about them. The other part is, uh, which is I think incredibly important, the way we frame precision medicine is we must put the human at the center of these projects. And, the, and we call, talk about the participant and the patient being foremost at the center because you must be in control of your data. Uh, you must have the ability to really understand it and interpret it and, and control. And one of those things is what we say is trust is consistency over time. And the way to achieve trust in this is to provide the transparency so you know that it's consistent over time. And at the end of the day, I think as, as uh, computer scientists and uh, people who are working as software developers, data scientists, it's not about if the algorithm is right or not. We have to fundamentally move away from the notion of precision and recall. What we have to move to is how is this perceived? Because you could be totally right, but if it's perceived in a way that, that is incorrect, that is not a good product. That is, that is, we have to move to a different framing of that, and that is, uh, that is uh, why I think ethics and the humanities are so important, because it teaches you that design component of how to think about a user and problem solving. Yeah, uh, perception versus precision recall, that's really great. And uh, you could argue, by the way, humanities is important for all people, not just data scientists. Yeah, so. Yes, that, that, uh, well said. <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, you're obviously now chief data scientist at the, for the U.S. government, which is terrific, by the way. Uh, what are you doing for the, for the government, really for us? Yeah, uh, so the, the number one thing is working to make sure that there will be a second chief data scientist for the United States. <laughs> when, when you're the first, you're measured by, will there be another? <laughs> uh, uh, so, it's a, it's, so what do we do when we, we ask, what are we actually really doing there? is the, the first thing is we have a mission statement. Like all great companies, you have a mission statement. Uh, it was a lesson, by the way, of mission statement I did not uh, get here from Silicon Valley. I got it when I worked in the government in the Department of Defense. And let me tell you, there are no, like if you, if you are with a, a, a bunch of guys who are really focused on military operations and saving lives and doing things, they are extremely focused on what the mission is. And so we said, what's our mission statement? And our mission statement is to responsibly unleash the power of data for the American public. And particularly that, that data is to return the investment of that data back to the American public. So what, what's the, kind of the key important points there? First is to responsibly do this. And, and we talked about the ethics component of that. But also unlock that. What does that mean? Well, we have tremendous data. We have so much amazing data that it is collected, and, and things like weather data, census data. There are 20 terabytes of data, raw data every day from the National Weather Service. The census data is incredible. We just saw, there was a result that was published just Friday or Friday before last that talked about what happens if kids who are in high poverty areas are allowed to move to a, a low poverty area. Like, well, basically, you know, areas that are, are not a high poverty. 
and the median improvement in their salary. Now, where does that data come from? That, like you have to, like, to get that much data, these systems already, we collect these, they're called it's called the IRS. It's called the census. You know, we have a foundation of amazing statisticians and economists inside the government, in every agency. And now it's our job to say, okay, how could we take that and return it back so that entrepreneurs can do something really unique with it? The same way in precision medicine, if we have, which has a, it, medicine has had a great history of opening up data, except at the, the, at the most recent time of interoperability between health systems, but there's systems like dbGaP that allows uh, DNA snippets to be used. And I just met a 10th grader, literally a 10th grader, at a White House science fair who had he, he got access to dbGaP, he built his own machine learning algorithms on top of it, and he was, he was right within precision of the best people in the world. A 10th grader who's living in the middle of nowhere. I mean, is, is, there is nothing more that rewarding than knowing about the future of your country when you see a 10th grader in the middle of nowhere coding up on dbGaP and kicking the butts of the top data scientists out there. Like it is, it is awesome. And so I, I think that, that that is a component. And then how do we use data in unique ways to, to really change the landscape of, uh, of the way we interact? Uh, I'll be going uh, just after this. Unfortunately, I can't stay too long. Uh, I'll be heading to Oakland uh, to... to uh, to the Oakland uh, Police Department to really spend some time working with them on how we think about opening up the data. And we just recently got 14 of the, the top police commissioners in the US. We brought them to the, data, uh, to the White House with the top data scientists, technologists, and just amazing what they're going to do by thinking about new ways to utilize the data. And, and oftentimes we're thinking, oh, wait, Ferguson and these type of things. But that's data to not just provide transparency, but data to also protect the police officer. We're in times of tough budget cuts, and they got to also know how to most efficiently deploy the, their, their officers and think about their safety as well. So being able to use data as literally a false multiplier for every component of our society is, uh, I, I couldn't ask for a better job. And, and a president that fundamentally believes in this and uh, you know, the innovations that all of you are doing is essential to that that you are the ones that are going to unlock the, the power of the data. It is not gonna be us in, in Washington. It is you who are gonna do it. It is our job to listen to you to better understand what is the policies that we need to make sure that it is easy as possible to really fundamentally transform how we, can, how we live as a country and improve life for all Americans. Yeah, great, thank you, it's awesome. Um, so you've had an exceptional career, uh, innovating in different companies, different sort of you know um, sort of stages, if you will, and then uh, also if you could argue, you could argue almost helping create the field of data science, or at least you know formalize that in some fashion. So there's a lot of folks in the audience who would love to get some advice from you on what they could do to um, innovate in this field. Uh, that was uh, the nicest way of saying I can't hold a job. <laughs> so, the, the, you know, the, the cool, the thing I think which is there is for if people are working in this space, really first focus on that, that clever beats smart. Clever beats smart nine times out of ten. You know, oftentimes we think of these things as um, having an incredible toolbox and you just throw stuff at it. Focus on figuring out what the problem is and then, once you've got the right problem, you have to apply the incredible smarts that we have with people to figure out how to scale it. So we don't want to lose th that side of it. The other part of it is, as, as technologists, really spend time with the customer. Really spend time with, with who, you're, who you're working with. And find problems that you are exceptionally passionate on. I think a lot of times it's very easy to, to work on a photo sharing app Guilty, <laughs> you know, we did that. It didn't work out so well. Uh, uh, but but the, the, the thing is, the problems that are out there, if you work on problems that really fundamentally improve the human condition, the great thing is not only is money lining up there, but the opportunity is there. And you will get a nuanced understanding of systems in a way 
that you will have phenomenal businesses. And I, I know people kind of listen to that and they're like, yeah, well, okay, that's just the government speak. But it's, it, it, and I'll, I think it's fundamentally true. You know, people don't realize that a lot of the innovations at LinkedIn for figuring out where your next job is and career center and all those things, you know what the motivation for that was? Veterans coming back. A lot of us were all had worked at the DOD and we had our friends coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, and we watched them make terrible career choices. We thought, well, if we have all this information, isn't it insane that we're not figuring out where they should, giving them the best set of choices? Where do skills translate? That, did, that company did okay. Uh, so, but that basis of that insight really comes from veterans. And, and I, I would just encourage people to take the time and look at those type of problems, because if you do, you will not sleep until you solve it. And that is, that is an incredibly cool thing to experience when you're in the flow of working on a problem like that. So uh, unfortunately, we are out of time, folks. I, um, we're actually well over our time. Uh, but uh, the one thing I do want to say is that, you know, when I listen to DJ, actually I feel really, really hopeful and, and optimistic. And the reason I do that is because um, it, the US government has the good sense to hire highly skilled people like him and putting him in positions which is going to help us all improve our human condition. And think about that for a minute. That's awesome. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, you're, you're great. Thank you. Good to see you.